Hello, and welcome to the first of six presentations on behavioral learning theories as they apply to schooling and education. My name is Bill Hewitt, and I am Professor Emeritus at Valdosta State University and adjunct professor at Capella and Walden Universities. There are two primary objectives for this presentation. First, by the end of the presentation, you should be able to describe the basic assumptions and focus of behavioral learning theories. And second, by the end of the presentation, you should be able to name and describe three learning theories associated with the behavioral approach. A basic assumption of the behavioral approach to learning is that there is a direct connection between environmental stimuli and the overt behavior of an organism. A second assumption is that the laws of learning apply to all animals, including human beings. Behaviorists make no distinction in this regard. In fact, the joke is that the laws of learning were established by studying three major animal groups, rats, pigeons, and college freshmen. In behavioral learning theories, learning is defined as a relatively permanent change in behavior brought about as a result of experience or practice. Other, more cognitively oriented theories would define learning as a relatively permanent change in behavior or behavior potential, or perhaps behavior and mental processes as a result of experience and practice. According to this theory, learning is an internal event, but it is not recognized as learning until it is displayed through overt behavior. The result is that all learning is considered a skill. There is little, if any, recognition of knowledge and or attitudes as those terms are defined by other researchers. There is recognition that biological maturation can have an impact on what environmental stimuli are relevant to the learner and how stimuli and behavior are connected. However, maturation is not seen as having a direct impact on learning as is the case in a Piaget approach to learning and cognitive development. The behavioral learning theory is represented as an SR paradigm with the organism, and remember that this term includes human beings as one type of animal, is treated as a black box. It is recognized that activity is occurring within the organism, but because it is not directly observable by the researcher, that is not considered as part of the laws of learning. That, therefore, leads to the behaviors hypothesizing that there is a direct connection between a stimulus and a behavior. There is no need to consider what might be happening inside the organism, according to these researchers. There are three major categories of behavioral learning theories. The first is labeled classical conditioning or respondent conditioning. This theory describes learning related to involuntary behaviors. The second is labeled operant conditioning. This theory describes learning related to voluntary behaviors. The third is contiguity theory. The theory describes the association of stimuli and responses when they occur together in the same time and or geographical space. Classical conditioning is so termed because it was the first type of learning discovered within the behaviorist tradition. It was later renamed as respondent conditioning for reasons that will become obvious when it is explained. The major theorist for classical conditioning was Ivan Pavlov, who lived between 1849 and 1936. He was a Russian scientist trained in biology and medicine, as was his Austrian contemporary, Sigmund Freud, who developed the psychodynamic approach to the study of personality. At the time of his discovery of the laws of classical conditioning, Pavlov was studying the digestive systems of dogs. In this picture, you can see an apparatus that has been attached to the dog to collect saliva. Pavlov became intrigued with his observation that dogs deprived of food began to salivate when one of his assistants walked into the research laboratory. That was interesting to him because the salivation by the dog indicated 
that the hungry animal expected to eat, even though it was not presented with food. As he investigated this event, he discovered that the dogs were associating his assistance with food. That is, the dogs were associating two different stimuli. One stimulus, the food, would automatically and reflexively elicit the response of salivation when presented to a hungry dog. The second stimulus, the lab assistant in a white coat, was simply an object attended to by the dog. This process of classical conditioning will be the focus of a more detailed description in the second presentation on behavioral learning theories. The second learning theory associated with the behavioral approach is operant conditioning. It is the study of the impact of consequences on the probability of an increase or decrease in emitted voluntary behavior. The major researchers who developed this theory were Edward Thorndike, who lived between 1874 and 1949, John Watson, who lived between 1878 and 1958, and B.S. Skinner, who lived between 1904 and 1990. Behaviorism, especially opera conditioning theory, was the dominant psychology paradigm in the USA from the 1930s through the 1950s. In Europe, the dominant paradigm was a psychodynamic paradigm of Freud and his colleagues. As stated earlier, all behavioral theories are SR, stimulus response paradigm, in that they investigate the supposed direct connection between stimuli and responses. This perfectly describes classical conditioning. However, opera conditioning might more readily be considered an RS paradigm in that the stimulus following a voluntary response will change the likelihood that the response will occur again. The organism is still considered a black box because what goes on inside the organism is not considered when describing learning. The last behavior theory to be considered is contiguity theory. The major theorist in the development of this behavioral approach to learning is E.R. Guthrie, who lived between 1886 and 1959. The basic principle of contiguity theory is that any stimulus and response that occur together in time and or space will tend to be associated by the learner. For example, a baseball player regularly prepares for a game by wrapping his wrists or putting on wristbands. Before one game, he puts on a new set of wristbands and hits two home runs during the game. As the new wristbands and hitting home runs occurred together, Guthrie proposed that they will be associated. The baseball player will tend to wear those same wristbands as they are now connected to hitting home runs. A second example would be a student who normally sits in one location to study and then changes that location and makes a good grade on a test. She will associate that location with making better grades and will continue to sit there when she studies. Guthrie's contiguity theory was one of the foundations for the development of the more cognitively oriented neural network theory. In an attempt to understand how biological networks produced learning, researchers began to study artificial neural networks. Using complex computer-based computations that were hidden from the researcher, network theorists can predict outcomes of more than one variable given multiple inputs. For example, a university might be interested in predicting who would do well in the freshman year of college and who would graduate using several predictive variables such as high school grades, scores on standardized tests, and gender, the researcher would run a simulated program using archived or historical data that would generate ever increasingly accurate predictions. The researcher would not necessarily be able to identify the particular connections and interactions that were used to make the predictions. These are hidden in the computational processes. Nevertheless, the computational program learns to make more accurate predictions as it is provided more data. 
In summary, the three types of behavioral theories all hypothesize a direct connection between stimuli and responses. In classical conditioning, the stimulus elicits or automatically pulls out a behavior that already existed within the organism. In this case, the connection between the stimulus, such as a puff of air, automatically elicits a response, such as an eye blink. What is learned is to associate a new stimulus with one that will elicit a behavior. A more detailed description of this theory will be provided in a following presentation. In operant conditioning, a behavior is voluntarily emitted or displayed by the organism. A stimulus that follows the response, labeled a consequence, will act on the behavior in such a way that the probability of that response occurring again is changed, meaning there will be either an increase or decrease in the likelihood that response will occur again. Several additional presentations will provide more details on this theory. In contiguity theory, stimuli and responses that occur together in time and or space will tend to be associated, sometimes in apparently random ways. A discussion of connectionism, an information processing approach to learning, will be discussed in a presentations, set of presentations focusing on cognitive theories of learning. There are five additional presentations related to the behavioral theories of learning. Additionally, there are several short quizzes that learners can use to check their understandings of the different learning theories.